Hello, everyone, and welcome down to episode number 32 of the Down South Photo Show with me, Brendan Waits, and my good friend down in Tasmania, Cam Blake. Good evening, Cameron. Good evening, Brendan. How are you this beautiful evening? Very well, and this is the second time that I have seen you today. We yes. have bookended our day uh, with each other, which kind of sounds creepy, but whatever, that worked. <laughs> There's so many things I could say to that, but I'm not. But yes, we are, we are bookending at the moment. Um, we had a very, very early start for uh, the reason that you'll explain in a second, and here we are again, you know, 12 or so hours later, um, yes. doing a bit more tidying up of this episode. But it's an awesome episode coming up, folks, and uh, yeah. Brendan's going to tell you all about it. So today, this morning, quite early our time, we had the absolute pleasure of interviewing Mr. Ben Horn, who uh, is an outstanding landscape photographer based in San Diego, California. Hence the early start for us. We decided to be to play nice and do it really early our time, and let Ben uh, have a fairly cushy time to do the uh, to do the yeah. interview. Yeah. Um, it was fantastic. Hopefully, uh, you'll enjoy it. We're going to put it on shortly so you for your for your listening pleasure and viewing pleasure if you're viewing he uh he's also visual um mm-hmm. but yeah we had we had a good chat almost close to an hour chat with ben uh he gave us his time uh quite gratefully and um had a really good chat about what he does he, he uses large format film and large format camera he wanders around the national parks of america and uh it was great to i've been watching his videos for a while which i'm sure all our viewers will do going forward um uh, yeah, he's, he's a bit of a champ, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we really enjoyed our time with Ben and here's the interview for you. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome down to a very special episode of the Down South Photo Show. Uh, as you can see, there's three of us on the screen, which is a little bit exciting for Cam and I to have a friend in the room. We better play nice, Cam. Uh it is with great pleasure I would like to welcome Ben Horn to the channel. Hello, Ben. How are you? I am doing great. It's, uh, this is this will be fun. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, this you know, you know, you've made it when you've uh, got a you're a guest on the Down South Photo Show, mate. You know this this thriving channel that we've got going here. Yeah. Is is there like a like a, a wall I get to sign or something like that? Like I mean, it's probably my own wall. Um, there is, which there I, is now. What a great uh, idea! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could sign the uh, with the tennis players sign the screen before they finish. Just, just sign on your on your webcam. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that yeah. that that would work. Yeah, that would definitely. Work. Well, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, and uh, you will after this interview, uh, Ben has got himself fifty two thousand YouTube followers, three and a half thousand Instagram followers. Although I think the Instagram account is relatively recent. Is that right? I, I started over. A few months back, yeah. Yeah, okay. And you say you started over. Were you at a certain level before that? And um, yeah, you know, I I think it was like thirty something thousand. I don't know, but like I um, I like kind of said goodbye to social media for a while, and I deactivated my Instagram and I deactivated my Twitter account, and just because I just wanted to kind of go without it for a while. And when yeah. I went to reactivate it, my Instagram account wasn't there anymore, even though it should have been. Right. Okay. And and then here's the weird thing: before before that happened, my username was Ben Horn Photo because Ben Horn was taken. But uh-huh. somehow, in the process of trying to log back into my account, I ended up with a different account, Ben Horn. <laughs> right. I I don't I'm not I don't know how it happened. It was it was a long since abandoned. Uh, account yeah um but it wasn't my account but now it is so i i honestly don't know what happened but i just know i have a better username so maybe when the maybe when it when you left every other band horn said well there's no point being on instagram anymore might as well all leave well i i from from what i understand there's there's a cricket player who's has the same Um, name and I, I'm Cam, sure. Cam, we should know that. We should know that. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Like maybe, maybe you guys have have heard that. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, so I, I think there's people that have that would prefer to have that even more than I do. Yeah. But I, I honestly don't know what happened. It's but. like it's like is there no end to this guy's talent? This cricket player has got a fantastic range of photography on his uh, Instagram account. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ben Ben Horn is actually we should really know this. He's not an Australian cricketer, but he's a New Zealander cricketer, which is Yeah, like no, just, I had a feeling he was a Kiwi. I I, yeah. I, I must uh, I reckon. Uh, I right, yeah. Well, there you go. 
there's more than one well people. you know uh, it's good to hear that other people struggle with technology i say sitting here in the four thirds ratio so uh yeah. Uh, welcome aboard, Ben. It's good to have you here. Ben is based out of San Diego, California. Um, so it's very, very nice of him to uh, give us uh, some of his time to chat on the Down South Photo Show. Um, I took a little extract from your website. Absolutely mm-hmm. did some research on this, Ben. Watch out. Um, <laughs> and I like your quote on your website. Uh, this is from Ben. My goal is to create simple, structured, and calm images of nature. I absolutely love working with large format film because the inherent limitation because of the inherent inherent limitations and the strong sense of discipline that is required. These limitations help to shape the final image by giving me a sense of direction. Nearly all of the photos on my website were photographed on eight by ten film and a few of my early images were photographed on four point four by five film. Uh, that that's pretty amazing. It's a it's a, it's a pretty amazing concept to know that you do primarily shoot on film, but not just any film, of course, large format film. Um, so I'd just like to unpack that a little bit if we can. I would like to start with, what does a simple, structured, and calm image look like to Ben Horn? Um, usually just something trying to find some way of making sense of the chaos of nature. Um, and honestly, a lot of times it just means me centering, like finding some sort of cool subject and like centering it in the middle of the composition. It's, you know, something symmetrical oftentimes. Um, but it's it's tough to to know for certain what's going to make a great subject, but you just know it when you see it. And I think the key thing is just spending a lot of time just wandering around. And at some point, there's almost always something where I'll, you know, I'm, I'm off somewhere in the middle of nowhere and I'll see something. I'll actually say something out loud. I'm like, well, that's that's pretty cool looking over there. Yeah. So if I if I find myself talking to myself, it usually means I found something that that's going to work pretty well. Um, but usually something that relies on on patterns, on textures, on shapes, um, uh, symmetry, stuff along those lines. Uh, just some way of of organizing the chaos of nature in a way that that fits nicely within that composition. Um, I recently went to, uh, it was was in January, I was in Death Valley, and I was there for eight days. And in a place like Death Valley, you have these, you know, massive grand vistas with these huge skies. And the entire time I was there, there was basically no clouds at all. So the the wide shots were a little bit more difficult. So I spent all my time shooting stuff on the ground and just pointing my camera at like mud and, you know, stuff like that. (laughs) Um, so it's just, you know, textures, patterns, uh, something that's very calming about it. So that's one of the things I really do enjoy shooting. Yeah. And, and do you, and do you look for this, a similar sort of thing when you're shooting wide? So when you're shooting landscape, I, I mean, it's, it's very clear if people jump on your website and have a look, the texture is, is quite important to you. So, uh, like cloud formation, rocks, that sort of stuff. You're also looking for that on your wide shots. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And usually in that case, trying to find some ways to show, like the the expanse of space, um, but it, I I don't do a lot of the um, the wider vista type shots, mostly because it's it's actually really um, it gets to be really difficult on large format at times um, to shoot those sort of photos because things happen so fast and things change so fast. Um, so I don't find myself doing it quite as many of those. Uh, even something like wind will shake the camera. Yeah, yeah. Um, which can be a challenge at times. Um, but there's something about like shooting those smaller scenes that um, where I can basically control more of the variables. Um, but yeah, I, I do look for the sim- similar sort of stuff on the, on the larger scenes. Um, yeah. And usually it's something where the foreground in some way interacts with the background in the sky. So it's all sort of seems integrated together. Uh, I guess in the same way you'd have that level of organization on a, on a smaller scene. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll probably talk a little bit more about the equipment later on because I'm absolutely fascinated by it. It's, <laughs> uh, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, if, if anyone wants to have a look uh, through Ben's YouTube channel and you, and you can see him at work in the field, brilliant channel, by the way. You, the, the way you deliver your content is uh, incredibly engaging. Um, the, 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 the quality of your edit and the quality of the, of the footage that you capture is, is excellent. So, uh, Appreciate below, that. folks, and a lot better than our editing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Heaps better. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a drive by on me. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> So, so when you are in the field and, you, and, you, and you're scouting for that next shot, um, for you, is it a process of elimination? I mean, like, I know, let, let, let's, let's use Zion uh, National Park for, as an example. I mean, you, you obviously spend quite some time there. Um, and I'm assuming you don't go out with uh, a goal in mind of capturing a fantastic photo. It's really you immersing yourself in these locations. Um, so, you know, do you stay on one shot and, until you've nailed it and then move on or are you backwards and forwards to locations? How does that work for you, Ben? So a lot of it is just coming up with a plan in the back of my head. So the, the first day I get there, um, oftentimes I actually do have some sort of subject or some sort of something specific in mind because it's something that maybe I tried to shoot the previous trip and it didn't turn out so great or maybe it's something I discovered on the previous trip. So. Normally I'll go there usually with a specific subject in mind um, and try to kind of get that out of the way. Um, but then it, it is just a matter of exploring, uh, wandering around, uh, just getting out there in the light and trying to uh, see how things have changed. Um, and then you just start noticing all these things. And at a certain point I might find, uh, like say, let's say I find like three decent subjects in one day um, but then, um, you know, I, I can, I'm usually good to shoot maybe like one or two subjects a day if I'm just going to sit there and wait for the light and everything. Um, so at that point, um, you just kind of come up with this plan in the back of your head in terms of, all right, oh, if it's a sunny day, this subject at this time is going to be good. And then you just start doing that and at a certain point, you know, seven days have gone by and you've shot all these photos none of which you had, well, maybe just a couple of them you knew about before going on the trip. Like maybe there was a particular tree that looked pretty cool that you found last year you wanted to shoot. Um, but then you just end up just day by day, just like checking off all the boxes on that list. Um, and I even take a, a little notebook with me into the field and I will write in that notebook sort of the expectations before going on the trip in terms of um, not, not necessarily specific photos, but maybe certain areas I want to explore. Um, and I'll write those down because otherwise I get out in the field, I completely forget everything going into the trip and there'll be certain areas I forgot to even look at. But then once I'm done with the trip, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll, in that same notebook, I'll write uh, subject discoveries. Um, so certain things I found, maybe like some cool looking rock pattern or something like that. Uh, so that when I return to that same area the next year, I can flip back to that notebook and I can look at the subject discoveries and kind of come up with a plan on what to shoot. Um, Cause otherwise, I mean, you can, you can plan all you want and have an idea of what you want to photograph. But once you get there, I don't know about you guys, but I just like completely forget about all that. Yeah. <laughs> and then I end up just like, there'll be times where there's like a particular hike I want to do. And I just completely, it, you know, just, completely forgot about it until I got home. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot to go look at that. Yeah. That's right. That's <laughs> so the, I find that the taking notes is good for that. that. That's where I find, um, I find the iPhone's awesome for that when you're out hiking because I do a fair bit of hiking as well down here in Tassie. But uh, I'll be, well, same sort of thing, you'll walk through a, se a section or a scene, you're like, oh, that looks really good. I, I really need to come back there at the right time of day or the right season, whatever it might be. I don't, I don't take a notebook. I'm not as sophisticated as that. I'll just get out the iPhone and I'll just sort of take a photo and then maybe write a quick note on my phone saying that that's definitely a winter shot or that's definitely a spring shot or whatever it might be. So um, I was going to ask, do you, you still obviously take your digital camera out. I've seen you with your, I think you use a Sony camera that you take out with you and stuff like that. Do you, I, do you find that you take some of. sort of scouting shots with that as well or is it all? I, I do what you do. I, I, I do the, um, I, I have my iPhone with me. So I'll, yeah. I'll actually use the iPhone for all the scouting photos. Yeah. Um, and because you figure, you know, a lot of the canyons and stuff, it's really dependent on, you know, specific times and stuff. So you can, you know, you got your date and time stamp right there. So you see exactly, exactly. what time the light looked pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I actually, I had a digital kit, but I actually, I accidentally, I actually recently uh, sold it off. Right. Um, Cause I thought that I was actually going to find myself using it more, but it just, I wasn't using it. So I sold it off. Yeah. Um, I do have, um, for recording the video, I have a Sony a7S II that yeah. I use. Yeah. Um, and then a Voigt Lander 21 millimeter 1.4 lens, which is like the only lens I use for doing the video. Yep. Yeah, cool. Um, but I, I don't use that for shooting any stills. It's just, just for video. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. the iPhone, I mean, it's, it's a good tool. And then the mm -hmm. other thing I find is really good. Um, 
and you can get them on Amazon. It's called the Artist's View Catcher. Okay. It's like this little um, gray piece of plastic, little window you open oh, yeah. up to a different aspect ratio. You just hold up and frame up. Yeah, you yeah, just yeah. hold it up and look through it. Yep. And it's it's kind of crazy. And I, I was thinking about because for when I go on my trips, you know, I, I put that in my pocket. And if I'm ever like walking away from my forerunner and then all of a sudden I reach down, I realize I don't have that with me. Like I got to go back. I got to get that. Yeah. So it's just as important as like, you know, wallet keys, artist view catcher. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's something about that where if you put a rectangle on a scene, your brain will tell you right away if that subject's going to work or not yeah. without even pulling out a camera or anything else. Yeah. Um, and you can figure out exactly where you need to stand. Um, and the other thing about that is that since it forces you to look through it with just one eye, uh, it also allows you to see it in two dimensions. Yeah. Um, so for me, that's the other really important thing in terms of uh, finding subjects. You'll see something that looks good. You pull that out, uh, look through it, and then you, you just you move it you know, further away and closer to you. You kind of change the focal length. Yeah. And after a while, you get familiar with what you know, what the lenses are going to be like with regard it's, to that. Uh, that's very Stanley Kubrick of you. I like it. Yeah, it's, it's you know, putting a rectangle on a scene, like, yeah. and it's, you know, a viewfinder that's as bright as daylight. Yeah, well, well um, it blocks so you out never the feel peripherals. Like you're a little box. It yeah. blocks out the peripheral, right? So you, 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 are, exactly. you are literally training your eye onto the, your eye onto the scene. So Yeah, and very, if, you, if I cool. find that, if I put it, like, right up against my nose, um, it's equivalent to... Uh, maybe about a 28 millimeter on a full frame equivalent. So if you go very wide, then it's not going to help you with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But from that to kind of more of a telephoto, but yeah, really, really important tool. And they're, they're very inexpensive. And I guess that's also the, the beauty, if you want to call it, with using large format cameras as well. It's not like you can just set up and quickly look through a viewfinder to get that, you know, that, that viewpoint of what you're going to get. Setting up a, an eight by 10 or a four by five, it's, it's a bit involved. Like it's a good few minutes to get everything set up, get it all focused, find a composition. Um, I, it does my head in trying to focus through, um, through the back of those old cameras and trying to, trying to see and get the light right. I, I don't, I don't have the patience anymore to, to sit there with the dark, <laughs> dark sheet over my head and get it right. But yeah, that, that little tool, that's a great little one. You know, it's, it's an instant composition right there in front of you. Oh, for sure. And especially if you're shooting a photo where you're trying to align certain elements, if you want mm -hmm. to have it like where the, you know, two trees don't really kind of like touch each other or whatever within the composition, um, using that tool, you can kind of look through it until it looks good. And then wherever you're standing, I'll usually put like a little, little mark on the ground, like with my, with my foot, just do a little X, go grab the tripod yeah. and then set it up at that exact same spot. So that way, when I do set up the camera, it's looking at basically exactly what I was looking at through that artist view catcher. Yeah. Um, you and at that you point, you're just kind of fine tuning the composition a little bit on the camera, as opposed to trying to figure out where the camera goes to begin with. Yeah. You don't set up a little tower of little rocks there, do you? Just to, just to no, mark the spot. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, no, Karens. No, no. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a sore subject there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, excellent. Uh, and, and pardon my ignorance, but when it comes to shooting a, a, a large format film camera, is your image also upside down in the viewfinder? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's upside down and it's backwards. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just which, just for the extra degree of difficulty for Ben Horn. <laughs> yeah, which which seems like that would be a big challenge, but there's something there's something kind of cool about that where if something looks good upside down and backwards, it usually looks better right side up. Yeah. Right. If something doesn't look right upside down and backwards, it usually looks worse right side up. So like there's something about it because it breaks the composition down to like shapes and lines and everything mm -hmm. else um, and to just a form. So you'll um, you'll notice things more. There was a um, back when I was in college, I think one of my professors was saying how um, one of the ways you can proofread is by reading, uh, reading something backwards. And, <laughs> And and that because your brain skips over things if you look at it forward. I don't know if it was maybe it's just like for spelling or but there's something about that how you read it backwards it makes your brain look at it differently. Yeah, no, I can I can understand just, that. I can yeah. understand that because our our brains are programmed to fill in the gaps automatically yes. for, for for processing and for speed. So when you do completely put your brain outside its comfort zone, literally by flipping an image and inverting it, yeah, uh, it abstracts it. Yeah. That's Which I think cool. is something that really does help for the kind of the smaller, more intimate scenes when you're kind of looking for that natural abstraction anyways and just to kind of simplify things a little bit. Yeah, that's, no, that's very cool. Yeah. You talk about the inherent 
inherent limitation that large format film brings. Now, I'm pretty sure that Cam and I understand what you're talking about there. In terms of, I mean, Cam and I are still shooting a little bit of film from time to time. Um, can you expand on what you mean by that for our viewers and listeners? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, dynamic range. Um, so basically, I'm shooting side film, so I have about five stops of dynamic range. Yep. Um, so that one's big uh, in terms of another thing is timing. It takes a while to um, get the camera set up, but then if the light's changing really fast, um, you have to be there ahead of the light. So you have to find your composition in the light that you're not going to be shooting <laughs> um, and think ahead to how things are going to be. Yeah. And there's something about that which, which really um, actually brings a lot of calm when I'm actually shooting. Um, there are some scenes I was photographing in Death Valley, some cool like cracked mud and stuff like that. And so I would get there around maybe one, two o'clock in the afternoon and just wander around until I found a subject. You know, usually I have the camera set up by about 3 p.m. and then just wait until sunset. And then going for that, that moment right when the sun is partially obscured by the horizon, where you get this kind of warm and cool directional yet softer light than you know the normal sort of sunset sort of light. And that, that light does not last very long. I mean, there you have maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute to shoot it as the sun is kind of going away more and more and more. And when I set up that camera, you know, several hours earlier, um, I had no clue how that light was going to look, you know, on that particular area I was shooting. Um, and once you put the film holder in, you know, you have no viewfinder anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you just kind of, working along those limitations but it, it forces you to you know find that subject ahead of time to figure out what when the good light's going to be and it actually brings a immense sense of calm when you're shooting because it, you don't have that frantic you know running around trying to find yeah. the subject and everything you're just like all right I'm just going through the steps and yeah. I it may work it may not yeah. I don't yeah. know yeah so, so you you've so literally that's one of the limitations you have literally honed an area down into literally one frame. So you're looking at yeah. one area the whole time. Do you ever yeah. do you ever have that sense of I'm in the wrong spot? This isn't this is you know I should be over there. If, even if it's only like a few feet or like you know, does that happen often? Uh, sometimes a little bit. Though I usually also shoot photos um, as the light progresses. So I'll shoot the different windows of light. You know, maybe like a blue hour. Um, last a little bit of daylight on it. And honestly, like, it, I guess this is kind of the, the thing where I have, where I, I find the whole YouTube experience to be a little bit odd because I think people will watch the videos wanting to learn something. Meanwhile, when I'm out there, I honestly have no clue how it's going to turn out. Like, I'm just like, you know, I found a cool subject. I'm going to wait for good light. I'm going to expose some film. We'll see what happens. I don't claim to know exactly what I'm doing with this. Uh, I know what's worked pretty decently in the past. Um, but it is it is an interesting experience because I still feel like every single time I'm setting up on the scene, I still don't quite know what's gonna happen. And I think that's also one of the reasons that keeps it keeps it kind of fun. The, the limitations make me work harder. And then the, the question of, is it gonna be a good photo? Is it not gonna be a good photo? Um, there was a, a photo I shot on the Death Valley trip. I'm starting to go through and make those videos right now. I didn't even bother scanning that sheet of film because I just, I looked at it right away. I'm like, no, that's not good. Yeah. Um, but then it's been a few, it's been a little over about a month now since I got the film back. And I looked at that sheet of film again. I'm like, you know what? I think I actually like that photo. So I scanned it yesterday and it was a shot I would have just completely written off both as I was shooting it as well as when I saw the film. But now my reaction to it's a little bit different. I actually kind of like it. Yeah. So it's, you never know. And that's the kind of the interesting part about it all. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things I love about shooting film, and I think you've, you've touched on it there, is that it just seems to slow everything down. Like, you, you, there's no, none of that rush to get things done. You know, you are generally prepared, you know, an hour or so before the light changes how you want it to be. And to me, I think that's something that's lost a bit on digital these days, is people just go out there and spray shots, and, you know, they'll come back with a thousand shots of, you know, Death Valley, and they get two or three out of them. But when you're shooting film, you know, I know when you go out in the field, you might only have half a dozen sheets of film with you or, or similar. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't be just spraying shots. You've got to really stop, think, get it set up, triple check your focus, triple check everything, make sure the exposure is right. I, I think that's something that can really 
be married into digital photography these days if people actually shot more like they shoot on film when they shoot digital. I think, you know, I did, I did a talk the other day for a camera club and exactly that, I said, oh, I shoot my digital stuff like I'm shooting film because, you know, it only takes a little bit extra of concentration, getting it set up, getting everything right in camera and it makes your editing so much easier at the end, you know, if you get a good file to start with. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's really important and I, I love the fact that it does slow you down and I think you're actually, like you said, you're more in the moment more often where um, oh, for sure. where we're digital, you know, you like, that looks good, I'll shoot that over there. Yeah, it looks good, histogram looks good, walk on. Um, and I like what you said also about the fact that you're working with, you know, five stops of dynamic range. You, you, <laughs> you haven't got, you can't be shooting in the wrong time of day or the wrong, the wrong light. You've got to be spot on every time, so. Yeah, and you find that most of the best light fits within those five stops just yeah, fine does. maybe use a grad filter yeah um and, and then another thing too um one of the things that i think is responsible for me uh learning what i have about many of the locations i have um and i attribute this to some of my early trips to death valley um so with my camera once the sun starts to set there's no change in the composition like once it's set it's set because then it's it's too dark to look at the ground glass anymore um, I can't see if it's focused right. I can't say anything. So what I learned early on was to set up early, wait for the light, stick with it. Yeah. Don't change that composition. Yeah. Just go with, with what you've got. Um, and early on, I found that I, my success rate wasn't particularly high. You know, you know, I'd set up for one thing and then something over my shoulder starts looking really good. Um, and then what I was aiming at wasn't really so great, but I found that the more I learned um, well, when things didn't go right, I would learn something. If it did go right, then I'd get a good photo. Yeah. And the more I did that process of get there early, find your composition, stay on that composition, do not move the camera, wait for the good light, then shoot the photo. Um, eventually my keeper rate started getting higher and higher and higher. Um, so I think that's also a really important thing. You know, you get there early, find your composition, stick with that composition just don't don't give up on it don't be tempted by whatever is going on going on over your shoulder um, because what you set up for that way you'll have a good subject good light and a good composition otherwise you're going to give up some of those things if you bail and start going for something else and, and they're and they're super, they're super simple rules for people taking landscape photography to just follow is like you said just Get, you know, just prepare yourself. Like, don't be a lazy photographer. Don't sort of just rock up at the spot at the last minute and think I'm going to get a Ben Horn shot because you're not. It's, <laughs> it's not going to happen. You need to really, like I said, study your locations, but study the weather, time of day, where you want to be. Uh, small little things that make a huge difference to the output, I reckon. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah you get you got to get to know location. Keep going back again and again. Uh, see it in different sort of weather conditions. And the more you learn about a condition the more you'll be able to predict what's going to happen ahead of time. Yeah. And then the more you'll be able to set up the camera where you want it to be ahead of time. And then it just makes life a heck of a lot easier. Can, to that end as well, can we just drill down a little bit into when you say setting up the camera? And mm -hmm. uh, again, the equipment that you work with is phenomenal. Now, how hard is it to come by an 8x10 film camera these days for a start? Um, you know, there's actually a pretty wide variety of them out there. Um, it used to be that they were just prohibitively expensive for most uses. Um, but the camera itself is actually very simple. It's, it's just a, a, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, they've imagined like the Ansel Adams kind of camera with the, um, you know, the lens on the front film holder goes in the back. There's a ground glass in the back. There's the bellows between it. It's actually a very very simple camera um, there's lots of ways of messing up but it's a very simple camera and as such there are some companies um, like there's a company over in the UK uh, called intrepid camera yep. and they make them out of plywood yeah yeah they're awesome. and, and <clears throat> they, they work great um, you know as you start paying more money you start getting more finesse over the controls um, so I have a camera from Arca Swiss. It's a very expensive camera, um, but everything's geared on it. Um, so if you're focusing, if it's geared, if you're, uh, doing all the other movements and stuff that you can do with a camera to try to get things more in focus by moving the plane of focus around and all that technical stuff, it's all geared for precision. Um, 
but the image that that shoots is going to be equal to the image that a camera like the Intrepid, which is made out of uh, plywood, will shoot. Um, just because it's all about the lens, it's all about the the film. So they're they're more widely available now than they were in the past. Uh, when I first started shooting eight by ten, I bought my eight by ten camera in two thousand eight. At that point, I bought it used. It was about three thousand um, dollars, and that was kind of the that was fairly normal at that point in time. So it cost about as much as like a you know digital SLR camera. That was a decent camera. Um, but now the um, the Intrepid cameras um, in U.S. dollars, I think they're like seven hundred dollars, maybe mm-hmm. maybe a little more than that, somewhere in about that range. Yeah. So it's a pretty affordable camera. Um, yeah. Considering it costs about as much as a more entry level uh, digital setup, um, but the cost of shooting the camera is that gets. A I mean, little the, expensive. The memory cards are a bit more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, it's yeah. it's about thirty dollars a click for right. shooting transparency film. Wow! But okay. again, that's one of the limitations that slows you down and makes you think a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and I mean, I, I freak out when I'm shooting thirty five mil film when it's costing me like two bucks a click. So I can only imagine, yeah. you know, with that, that that cost involved. Um, yeah. So, which, which was actually you, 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 you were all over it. My, my next question was, how expensive is eight by ten film? So, you know, you're buying film. Do you, do you buy it by the box? How, how, how do you how do you acquire your film? Yeah, yeah. So it's um, so I shoot mostly Fuji Provia, which is a transparency film. So if people just think of shooting slides back in the day, except for these slides are eight by ten inches. Um, there's twenty sheets um, per box, and that particular film is a about 330 US dollars for a box of 20 sheets of film. Um, some of the other film is closer to $400. Um, and then processing is another $10. So you know, it can easily get to about $30 a, a click for the film. Um, but you don't think about that really when you're when you're shooting it. Um, the one thing that's, that is the major annoyance of shooting this sort of camera is having to load the film. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. I have like a little film changing tent in the field and I've got it actually rigged up pretty good where um, I can stand, I can have the, the rear hatch of my forerunner, forerunner open. I can have the film changing tent there. I got stereo speakers going with some satellite radio and just sit there in shade and relax a little bit. But it, it's a bit of an annoyance. Yeah, no, I can imagine. I mean, there is a, so much that goes on with that kind. It, it's such a hands on process, which, you know, obviously speaks to the inherent limitations that you've got with film. Um, yeah. How, how often do you trash a sheet of film? Uh, it happens. Uh, yeah. I, I usually on a trip, um, there's at some point where I end up just, you know, a sheet of film, something weird happens. I just, I pull the film out of the holder so I don't end up accidentally having to pay to have it developed because I know it's not going to be good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it does happen. It happened to me on my past, on my past couple trips. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah, it just kind of comes with the territory. Yeah. So, do do you process your own film? I don't. There's actually a lab that's about a, a 45 minute drive from my house, um, and they can do all the developing there. Uh, transparency film, it's very temperature sensitive and all that, so I just leave that to the pros. I know some people will do that themselves and they can save some money, but um, for me, it's keeps the local business going, which is which is kind of nice. And when yeah, you, so when you, you Sorry, Brent. I was just going to say, when you're scanning, um, scanning a film, do you do your own scanning, like with the drum scanner, or is it a flatbed scanner? Or yeah, so I, I have a flatbed scanner at home, which actually does a pretty good job. It's an Epson. Um, yeah. It's an older model now, like a V700. Um, but then I have a friend who has a, a drum scan business, and I use him for the scan. So if someone orders a print, uh, I'll have a drum scan done. And for those that aren't familiar with that, it's a very high resolution scan uh they can it's very flat so you don't have any weirdness with uh the the corners of the scan or things get a little distorted or stuff like that like a flatbed can do Um, and then once you have that scan done it's like 300 megapixels and then you're pretty much set with that sheet of film for any print size you ever really want to do but i scan at home first and then if someone orders a print then i'll have the the fancy expensive scan done yeah yeah that's cool Yeah. yeah um just moving along a little bit, you, you mentioned on your website, there's another quote from the Ben Horn website, folks, uh, linked <laughs> below. I am truly honored if you choose to hang my work in your home office or business. Um, so clearly you get a 
you still get that buzz out of when someone purchases one of your images. Um, but do you see your photography, it's become your livelihood or is it more of a hobby that you make money from? So it started as something that I enjoyed. I never, never, um, I never really thought that I'd end up doing photography for a living. Um, but back in 2009, I went on my first solo photography trip. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I was actually working in a camera store at the time and the economy dropped out. And so, uh, the owners of the shop were like, Hey, if anyone has any ideas on how we can make it through this, I'm like, Hey, I'll just, I'll go on a trip. Don't pay me, you know? Uh, so that started a tradition of me going on like three trips a year that were like one to two weeks long. Um, the vast majority of which were completely unpaid because it was something I enjoyed doing. Um, YouTube wasn't really a thing at that point in time, at least not for photography. Uh, so I ended up just putting some little videos up there and then just over the years that has grown up. So I never, I never pursued YouTube as, Hey, I'm going to like find a way of, you know, monetizing this and making a living at it. Um, which is why I, I don't have any ads on there right now. Um, just because to me that kind of makes it into like something I have to do, you know? Um, but then, uh, once, uh, I started, oh, I started transitioning my, my day job. Uh, so I was, I had worked at a camera store here in San Diego from 2004 when I graduated college all the way up until 2020. Uh, at the start of the pandemic is actually when I decided just to go off on my own and do my own photography stuff. Um, but up until then, I think starting in 2017, I started scaling back my hours. So I was working four days a week instead of five. And then the next year I went to three days a week and I was set, uh, for, um, I think 2021, I was set to be doing photography full time. Uh, but as soon as the pandemic hit the store closed down, I'm like, well, Yes, I'm doing photography now. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. but I had I had the, force, um, for, it the infrastructure your hand to, to do it. Yeah, yeah, but you know that's that's kind of what happens a lot of times um, in life where you, you're you kind of want to go a different direction, but it takes a little bit of a shove uh, to go in that direction. Um, but I had the foundation laid um, to the point where I was able to to make that transition um, and be okay with it. So that's so I I am doing photography as a career now. Um, though it's not something I really thought would happen when I first got into it. And I've just been trying to do it on my own terms where it's not work. It's actually something I enjoy, um, which means giving up a lot of, uh, the, the nicer things in life because <laughs> you know, yeah. landscape photography obviously doesn't uh, pay extremely well. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but there's always a way of making it work. Yeah. But you, you're raking in all that cash from those NFTs you're selling though, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, I take pictures of, of rock stacks and sell them as NFTs. Yeah. So a side hustle. I wasn't going to yeah. mention the NFTs, Brendan, but you brought it up, but I wasn't going to touch yeah. that. It's a bit of an elephant in the room there, but that's okay. Yeah. Well, um, Brent, Brent, Brendan owns a camp. Brendan runs two camera shops. And if, if your old owners of the camera shop, Brendan, you're like, Brendan, he's playing golf later today. He's not going to work. He's just going to go hit, hit the course. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Nice. I, I hardly, I hardly work at all. That's exactly right, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, that, is that bloodshot enough for you? Yeah. <laughs> um, so Ben, th this is a pretty open-ended question, but what's the hardest you've ever had to work for an image? Um, it's a, it's a tough one. I will say that the most difficult trips are usually the backpacking trips. Yeah. Um, because, you know, just they, they sound really great on paper. But once you get out there, yeah. it's, it's a little bit of misery that usually <laughs> results in some good photos. Well, th th this is, um, this usually resonates with us because on. Cam's just had this experience of a, of a massive trek in, in Tasmania where he, well, he said himself, he, he found it so difficult to capture images because he was physically exhausted. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, hate, it just it just it. takes <laughs> it, it takes you to like if, if you're if your mind's not really in the game um, because other things are going on. Um, there, there was a um, there was a trip I went on back in 2019 
and I was backpacking into this canyon that not a lot of people go to. And to get to it, there's a river you have to cross. And it's usually kind of more of a nice, gentle stream. Um, but that river, when I was 99% of the way there to the location, I had to cross the river to get to where I'd camp. And the river was a lot higher than normal. And the area where you usually drop into it to cross, because I've been in that canyon lots of times, it had been eroded out. So I found myself like swimming downstream with a big pack on. <laughs> A little scary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I ended up making it to there and, and shooting a photo there. So maybe that was that was a photo. And also there was this, there was a, a, a huge angry bull in that canyon <laughs> that sounded like a dinosaur with its like bellowing roars echoing off the canyon walls. It was a completely miserable trip. Yeah. Um, photo turned out okay. So maybe maybe that's maybe maybe that one. I don't know. If you well, could, I would it's say, an experience uh, I don't want to recreate. I would say nearly, nearly drowning and fighting off a T-Rex. That's pretty tough to, you know, to get yeah, a photo. It's, it's on the list, <laughs> top five maybe. Yeah. And, and, any any photo where you come back with all your limbs has got to be a better photo than without limbs, I imagine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I, I think I, even just watching the, the 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 YouTube channel that you have, like again, I, I do a bit of hiking, but just watching you lug a big camera bag with that eight by ten equipment and. Every, every time I watch one of your YouTube clips, like that bloody tripod that you've got, that huge tripod on the side that you use, I'm like, I, I, that would just do my head. I would throw that out like within the first kilometer of my hiking. Like I'd all handhold everything. <laughs> so yeah, how, how, on average, how much weight would you have in your your backpacks when you're doing that kind of stuff? You know, it, it varies a lot. Um, so when I go on the backpacking trips, um, I can really pare things down a lot. The pack looks big. It looks heavy. It really isn't. It's just bulky stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's about 50 pounds is right. what I've been able to get the pack to, which is actually, it's not bad at all. Mm. Um, but that's with a lightweight camera, lightweight lenses. But that's also with all the survival gear and stuff. Yeah. Um, it's. I would say it looks like it's a bulky pack. I mean, it looks like a heavy pack, but it really, it's not that bad. Um, yeah. I think... People, if you have like a, a DSLR, a few lenses, all that sort of stuff, you're approaching the similar weight. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And do you do you camp out at all, or is it do you generally just do like you know it might be you know one long day back to the car and another big long day and back to the car, or do you actually stay out overnight some places? Uh, so it depends on the location. So um, place like Zion, there's a campground in town there that I stay at. Yeah. Uh, Death Valley. Um, there's a campground, but also you can, you can camp in a lot of different places in the park, um, which is just, you know, just sleeping in the back of my forerunner. Yeah. Um, but then I'll go on the backpacking trips where that's like, I'm out there for days and, and, and that's just, you know, me sleeping in a little bivy on the ground or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. but it's once, once I kind of get away from the, the comfort and the convenience of having my vehicle there, uh, yeah, it does, it gets a little more difficult. Uh, yeah, that's for certain. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you um, have any of your own artwork hanging in your own house? I do. Um, so in my living room, I have three photos hanging, which I was actually very resistant to. Um, I didn't want to have my own work hanging because I felt like if I looked at it every day, I would only see the flaws of it, and I think I'd resent it. Um, <laughs> but as it turns out, I'm actually okay looking at them. And, and actually, um, for those that are watching the, the video feed, uh, there is a photo on the wall behind me. Uh, it's a black and white print that my wife made in college when she was in a photography class. Uh, so I have one of her, her photos hanging in my office. Um, then I have a, you know, three 16 by 20s of some of the various images I've shot in the, in the living room. Um, and actually, the, the process of choosing which ones to hang on your wall, that's a tough one. Um, it's, it's a lot more difficult than one would think because they have to play nice with each other and also play nice with the room. And, mm. um, and when you shoot color, that's a bit more difficult. Black and white, it'd be a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. So you do have favorites of your own photos, I'm assuming. Is there one particular image that stands out or do you have a group of images that you really like? Or it, It's kind of constantly changing. I, yeah. If I had to yeah. choose like my five favorite image, my five favorite images that's, that's a good yeah. way to go <laughs> my five favorite images um it would be really tough to do because um, i find that it constantly 
changes and it evolves. Um, there might be an image I thought I liked, but then I look back at it at some point, I don't like it quite as much anymore. Um, in general, and I, I think a lot of photographers might say the same and you guys might be the same. Um, in general, I'll, I'll look at the photos I've shot and I kind of get tired of looking at them. I'm kind of, <laughs> kind of like, you, you almost in some ways learn to like resent the photos a little bit, but then what happens is if I ever go back to that location where I shot it and I look at it again, I'm like, oh no, no, I did a, I did a good job with this photo. Yeah. Um, but something about just seeing the flaws in our own work and like wishing we had done something a little bit differently, done something a little bit better. Um, but, but I think it takes revisiting that location and seeing that subject yeah. again to realize that, oh no, I, I actually did it. Did yeah. Well, that's when the stuff. notepad comes out, right? And it's like, okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Write yeah, that sort, down. You know, sort that out things for the next off, time. Yeah, absolutely. I got, a, I got a classic example of how one of those photos that you have on the wall eats away at you. I did. I did this photo of these blue sort of shells, like seashell things, and my mum loved it. And mum, you know, mum's always the number one fan. I'll, 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 I'll print of that. So I did a canvas, like a big sort of square canvas, and it's hanging on the wall at mum and dad's house. And in buried in amongst all these little shells, which I didn't see until it was blown up big, is this dirty yeah. rotten cigarette butt that's sort of been oh. discarded and because it sort of marries in with all the blue and the sand and stuff like that yeah and i was sitting at mum and dad's house one night and i'm like what is that in there and i got up close and i look at it i'm like i didn't even see that did not even notice it and now i cannot <laughs> unsee it so mum and mum's yeah got, you can't unsee no, it mum's got this beautiful picture that she thinks is wonderful and i look at that and go why are these why is that even out of a off, off lightroom why is that even printed like that should not have even seen the light of day but yeah it's hard. It's hard to unsee it once you see it. That's for sure. Yep. That's that's been my experience on a lot of things. But, um, but yeah, yeah. That's once. And it's usually once you print it big, and once you pay a lot to have it printed. Yeah. Um, that's when you notice it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Once you've, <laughs> once you've given the money to Brendan for printing it. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. I, I love I love people like that. That's perfect for me. It's a it's a redo immediately. Um, <laughs> we. Uh, ben, we've got a whole bunch of questions, but but this is obviously going to uh, we are on a bit of a time limitation. But uh, we we wanted to I wanted to ask you. It, well, Cam actually put a question down um, that we wanted to ask you, and that was uh, in last week's episode on the Down South Photo Show. We talked about photography being good for the soul. Um, do you find this to be the case when you venture out into the wilderness? Oh, definitely. It's uh, I find it to be quite soothing. Um, especially, you know, working with large format underneath a dark cloth where everything else kind of goes away. You only look at that photo right in front of you as you're setting it up. Um, so I, I would agree that it is uh, just as long as the conditions are going pretty well and the trip is going pretty well. Because uh, at, at some point it can also kind of turn on you pretty fast and you're like, I have no desire to be here right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if everything's okay. going pretty well, I, I I would agree with that 100%. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. was, we also touched on in one of our episodes earlier, um, just setting goals for yourself each year. And I, I like to try and as a photographer, I like to sort of get into the new year and say, right, this year I want to do here or I want to go there or I want to try and shoot this or do that. Um, you obviously do multiple trips a year. Um, is that mainly what your goal setting is, is to get out to those same spots and try and create something different? Or do you try and set yourself a higher bar when you go out or, or what, what's the process there? I think the way the best way to describe it would be to continue to expand on the areas that I know in terms of um, that's not a really good way to describe it. But so imagine, uh, you know, you go to an area, you kind of you find a particular subject you like and then you explore a little further and then on the next trip, you explore a little further. So you kind of keep branching out into these areas. Um, so even though you're returning to a familiar area, there's always another area nearby that I want to check out. I want to go see. And so it's it just kind of like almost like a tree that kind of keeps branching out and branching out yeah. as you continue to explore some of these areas. So I don't really have any specific goals other than to just kind of keep on that path because it's led me to some pretty cool areas and pretty cool subjects. And I find that I just get, find these areas that are more and more remote and more and more off the beaten path. Yeah. So that's kind of how I would do my, my goals just to keep exploring. Yeah, cool. And now we're just, uh, we've, like I said before, we're going from summer into autumn or fall, as you, you guys over there like to refer it to. Um, do you have, yeah. do you have, that, to me, autumn is the favorite, my favorite season to shoot in, just with the colors and oh, the weather sure. and stuff. Would that be your favorite season to shoot in or? It is because it's, it's very fleeting. 
Um, and it changes, at least the areas where I shoot. Um, so when I go to Zion, like the maples, every year you can have the exact same tree, but each year the color will be different on that same tree. Yeah. Um, and whether the leaves stay on, whether they fall off, how they're arranged on the ground. So you can go to the exact same spot over and over again, and no two autumns are going to be the same. Yeah. Um, so I, I do really appreciate that. Um, I also really do enjoy the simplicity of winter, um, whether ice and snow and how it can completely transform a, a landscape, um, and also less crowds at a lot mm. of the areas, um, yeah. which is important. So I'd say fall, yeah, it's probably good. But, you know, winter, I, I think, has lately been a bit more of my my choice just because the areas are quieter. It's off season. Yeah. Yeah, less people yep. is better. Yeah, well, that can yeah. make make a real difference if you get to a location and you've got forty other photographers, you know, stomping around yeah. the area as well. I look at that, I'm like, nope, 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 <laughs> going away. <laughs> Drive on. Yeah. So, obviously, being based in San Diego, California, you, you, the majority of your shooting has been in the states. Um, have you ever ventured outside the U.S. to shoot? I have never been outside the U.S. Not, not one. I know it's kind of like the stereotypical kind of American thing, like, ah, oh, they don't travel abroad. But I, I think just because of the areas that I like to pursue, they're actually all fairly close to where I live. Um, even though I'm driving, you know, eight hours to get to Zion, it's still one of the closest national parks to where I am. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's Joshua Tree, which is a little bit closer, but. Um, so I, it is basically based on proximity um, to the areas yeah. I go to. I do prefer traveling uh, with my vehicle. That way I just have everything I need to be completely self-contained. Um, there's no rigid um, structure in terms of like, oh, I have a flight on this particular day, so I have to be there at that yeah. time. I can yeah, just yeah. play it by ear. Um, so I don't really have much of a desire to travel abroad because also it'd be very difficult to with the camera and setup and the film and everything I have. Um, so I, I do like, I, I do like being self-contained and so I, it's a lot of areas nearby that are the areas I really, uh, plan to shoot. Yeah. And shoot and uh, taking, taking film on airlines and taking film through x-ray oh, machines. Yeah. That's just, no, that's a no go. It, it would be a hassle. Yeah. Um, no. yeah so then I want to, I want to see I, the video of you jamming your eight by 10 camera into the overhead compartment. Oh yeah. It's crunch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would that would not be a pleasant experience, and if it falls out, it, that would, that would, that would hurt someone very badly. Yeah, yeah. Well, well speak, it's just um, speaking of the um, the the limitations you might have, do you have limitations in the states for selling your images that have been taken in national parks? No, not for national parks. Um, for some state parks, they will have uh, stuff, but if it's a national park, if it's a, kind of like the fine art sort of photo. Um, no permits, no licensing, nothing like that. Um, if it was something, uh, a f- photography for a commercial application, like, like the whole, like influencers taking pictures of products in national parks. Yeah, that that's, that's a no, no. Um, yeah. but the, the laws are, if it's basically just you and the camera, there's no support crew, there's no commercial stuff. Uh, that's wide open. So that, that makes things pretty easy here. I don't know if it's the same for you guys over there, um, but it's pretty easy going here. Yeah, we, um, we have, we have, yeah, for, I guess that it's a bit of a gray area with national parks in Australia, what you can shoot and what you need a license for shooting. I think it's, I think it's fairly similar. If you're doing a big commercial shoot or something like that, you need, you need to get some proper, proper permissions. But otherwise, if you're just going out and taking lovely photos of the park, that's generally perfectly fine. So, um, but that, that'll, that'll probably change in the future. They'll ruin that for us as well. We need a special license. Yeah, it, we can blame the influencers for that again, just to ruin everything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Um, so we've got a very small but loyal following on the Down South Photo Show. Um, so if you could offer any advice on shooting landscapes to our listeners, and I know that's really hard. I mean, you've got so broad. But uh, if you could offer any advice to our listeners for shooting landscapes, what would that be? So what has been beneficial for me, and this may not necessarily be beneficial for everyone, but what's worked for me is traveling solo, um, which is huge because you can follow your curiosity. You're not catering to uh, the needs of anyone else, especially, I mean, even, even if it's another person that I'm going somewhere with and they're a photographer and they're of exact like mind as me, I can guarantee you that there will be areas that I will just not, um, 
I won't photograph them. I won't pursue something that I wanted to just because yeah. I'm thinking more about like, I don't want the other person to be bored, but traveling solo, um, spending a lot of time at a location. Like if you spend about a week at a location, you really get to know that location very, very well. Um, and, and also, um, you know, since I am doing this for a living now, I might come across as like, oh, you know, of course he has the ability to spend all the time he wants in these areas. The amount of time I spend in the field now is actually the same as when I was working full time. Yeah. Um, I just go on a few trips a year and I would take time off work unpaid uh, to go on those trips. Um, but, you know, I, I don't, I'm not out in the field every day. I'm just out, you know, a few, few trips a year for about a week at a time. Um, and then the, the final thing would just be to, you know, find that composition, find that subject, wait for good light, stay on that shot, don't give it up. Yeah. Uh, if the photo turns out, you will have a good composition with good light and a good subject. If it doesn't turn out, you're going to learn something. And that's something that you're going to, you know, take forward next time. And maybe the next time you will get better at it. So yeah. those are the main yeah. things. Travel solo if you can, if it's safe, all that sort of stuff. Uh, spend time at a location and stay on a shot. Don't give up until like it's full on, like the light's done, done, done. Yeah. 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 That's awesome advice. Well, there, there you go, listeners yeah. and viewers. That's uh, some fantastic oh, Brendan, advice you're muted. from. Where'd you go, Brendan? Oh, hello. You've muted your microphone. <laughs> Have I? Sorry. No, you're still there. You go. Try again. Hello. Sorry. There you go. Uh, <laughs> te technology at six o'clock in the morning, guys. This is how, how it works for us over here. Um, so <laughs> that's some fantastic advice for um, for our listeners and viewers of the Down South Photo Show from an absolute pro. Um, highly recommend if you haven't already check out Ben's work uh, in the in the links below. Uh, probably just lastly, um, the way you present your work. Uh, for sale now, Cam. I don't know if you've got it available. You've, you've got uh, one of Ben's photo boxes I do. there. Um, yeah, awesome. I, I was just blown away by. Well, I was, I was blown away before I even opened. It, I was blown away by the box and the presentation. I was like, no, oh, that's a lot of effort put in there. But um, yeah, I bought one of your box sets, as you probably would know. Um, yeah, appreciate yeah, that. and it's, it's. I think it's a great product that you know if you know you can put together a collection of images that someone's got over over the twelve month period and. And send it out. There's a lot of really lovely personal touches in these box sets, which I really, really appreciated. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's a great way of putting your work out there. I think I think that's something that maybe a lot of photographers maybe do struggle with. Is like, well, I've got these lovely photos. I can frame them up and give them to mum or dad. But how do I take it to the next step and and maybe get my work out there? But um, for anyone who loves to get a collection of photos, I think you know, looking at Ben's work and getting the box sets. Um, have you done your twenty? Your, you put you put them together and release them. When uh, uh, basically right after my my autumn trip. That's right. When I when I put them when I put them together. So um, yeah. My and, and actually the box sets are kind of cool because it works two ways. It it gives me um, you know a way of making some income and you know producing the prints and all that sort of stuff. But it also it gives me a um, a goal to end the year with ten photos I really really like. Yeah. Um, so it puts pressure on me when I go on the trip that I know that if I go on a trip, if I go on three trips a year, I know I need to come back with each trip with slightly over three photos. I'm very, very happy with. So it makes me put in the effort in the field. Mm. Um, and so it, it, it helps me from that standpoint of it allows, it gives me incentive to be productive and to produce work that, you know, it, that I really do like. And if you have a photo, um, and you print like, you know, a hundred something copies of it, you gotta make sure you really like that photo. Yeah. Um, so That's right. so that, that also works for that sense of uh, incentive there. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a fun project to get, put together. It's a, it's a huge project to put together, making all yeah. the prints, I make all this stuff myself. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, always, it's always a nice project to kind of round out the year with. It probably, just, probably justifies to the wife, you going away on holiday, uh, taking photos all the time, if you can come back and say, well, this new dolls. I've she got, actually, actually done she actually, <laughs> yeah, she, she actually loves it when I go on the trips because we're both very much introverts, and right. so, um, so this way, like when I go on a trip, then she can have some time just to relax, to hang out, and so she kind of recharges. I kind of recharge. Yeah. Um, so she she actually encourages me to go on the trips. Uh, there's like a, a storm head in design. She's like, you should definitely go to Zion. I'm like, yes, I should definitely go to Zion. <laughs> yeah, so get out it, of the it works out really, really well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. 
Well, well, Ben, this has been absolutely brilliant. Um, you're a very, very uh, well-spoken individual and you obviously know your craft inside out. So um, from the bottom of our hearts, we can't thank you enough for coming on our humble little yeah. channel. It's been absolutely a brilliant chat and uh, we'd love to have you back on at some time because I think we've got through about half of the questions, uh, but we were trying to sort of <laughs> limit this to roughly an hour of your time. So we do really appreciate you giving up your yeah. time to join Thanks us on so the much. Down South Photo Show. Well, yeah, it's been fun. I appreciate that. Yeah, no worries Definitely. at all. And uh, we will uh, look forward to seeing what you produce next. Have, have you got something on the horizon? What's the, where's the next trip? Uh, so I, I've got, um, I'm, I'm working on the, the videos from Death Valley. Um, so I'll get those out pretty soon. Um, I went to Zion in the wintertime. I did not do any video on that trip as a, kind of a little experiment. Um, so I got some pictures from that. And then the next one up is a backpacking trip uh, during the springtime to some canyons I've been to as well as some new canyons I haven't been to yet to explore there and see what I can find and you know try not to get drowned by rivers and stuff like yeah, that so yeah or eat, eat, eat by a T-Rex yeah yeah yes yeah. yes excellent beautiful all right Ben thank you very much for your time thanks everyone for tuning into the Down South Photo Show we will see you next time thanks Ben there you go folks what a fantastic interview with Ben um I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as we do. Um, I found myself actually watching that interview live like it was an episode of the Down South Photo Show. Um, very, very captivating talk to Ben Horn. What do you think, Cam? Yeah, I, I loved it. Um, it was definitely worth getting up early for. And uh, I found my, a, bit like, a bit like you. I, was, I wasn't starstruck, but I was really like he, just the way he talks and the way he tells what he does out in the field. Uh, you really do, do get involved. And I think it's a credit to him as well. Like he has his movies and his videos that he does on YouTube where, like you said, on one of the other episodes, you know, put it on a big screen and watch it as a production because he does an amazing job. But I think he, he's just a professional through and through. Uh, we had a bit of a chat to him before and after as well. Just a really nice guy. Uh, his work speaks for itself. And uh, yeah, I was the same. I, I, I was entrenched the whole time just listening to him and, uh, you know, listening to how he goes about it. Yeah, absolutely. And he's, he's got a fantastic voice for it too. So mm. thank you again, Ben. Um, as you probably saw, if you were watching, um, we were cycling through quite a few of his images. So thanks again, Ben, for letting us put those up on the screen. That was absolutely awesome. Um, of course, we're going to put all the links below for Ben's website, Instagram, YouTube, all that sort of stuff. It would be awesome if you could swing by uh, any of his pages and give him some love from the Down South Photo Show, telling yeah. him you saw tell him that you saw him on our show. That would be brilliant. I'm sure that um, people like to get that kind of feedback, particularly Ben. So yeah. if you can do a favour for us and do that, that would be brilliant. Mm. Um, have, we, have, so, we, have we created a monster here, Brendan? That, you know, we've now got our first international guest. Uh, it, it all went real, really smoothly for us, us, us all technical and stuff. We didn't, have any, <laughs> we didn't have any issues at all with it, which is amazing, apart from the early morning. But maybe, you know, we've, we've created a monster. I know we've said we're going to try and get a guest a month to do a live show a month. Yep. Uh, so uh, we've Brendan and I were behind the scenes. I think we've come up with a bit of tic tac toe here that I'll get one guest, he gets the next one, and vice versa. Yep. And we'll just see how big we can get. You know, I have um, set my sights pretty high, uh, so we'll see how we go. But um, yeah. I well, have already sent off a couple of emails today. Mm -hmm. I got I was inspired by the chat with Ben to I'll, maybe see who else we can get. I'll give you the red hot tip though. The guy you told me that we're going to get, I don't think you're going to get a reply from that first one, but <laughs> I hope, I hope, I hope to, I hope to look forward to see what you come up with. It's going to be good fun. Okay. No, I, I like a challenge, mate. You know that. So uh, that'd be great. Very good. Uh, so as we do each week with the down south photo show, just a quick little bit of, um, bit of homework, Cam, what do you got? coming up in this week and I, with everything you've got going on i am off to the tarkine on saturday so we start our four-day uh tarkine workshop it is chopper block uh as we've been talking i've been getting emails from the hotel about rooms and shuffling things around because it is very busy at the moment down here in tassie uh but we're going to spend four or five days immersed in the tarkine crazy coastline amazing forests beautiful rivers a uh, bit of wildlife and stuff like that so i'm really excited this is like the first workshop of the year that's kicking off as well so um it's going to be pretty busy from here on until about november so you can sit there and watch me just fall apart on each episode as i get tighter and busier as we go through the year and That'd how about you awesome. you've got uh your well i was just going to say to that end hopefully at some point we can record one of these on location um mm. we have the ability we have the technology we can make this happen um maybe a bit of a bummer when a bit of a bummer when internet lines get severed 
between well, the mainland and Tasmania, yeah. but uh, there you go. Well, I was getting a bit nervous last night that we had Ben lined up for this interview this morning. I'm like, <laughs> of, of all the time for the internet to be chopped off across Bass Strait, that's t- today. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah I, think, I think, yeah, definitely we will organise, um, yeah, an in-person live type of, uh, we'll go out somewhere and maybe do a shoot together, Brent, and we can record it and do it live and stuff like that. So we'll talk about yeah. that. Uh, yeah, I think, no, I think I'd, I'd be, I'd be, I'd love to do something like that. And I think a little bit similar to what we've done with the Bright Festival of Photography, where we've done live broadcast. Um, we've opened it up for people in the area. If you want to come down and say good day and come out for a shoot with us or catch up for, you know, a chat as we're getting along, feel free. We'll, we'll probably let you know the location beforehand, but uh, that's definitely on the cards in the next uh, next month or two or so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, me, I've got uh, coming up next week, I'm doing a talk at a retirement village, which will be interesting. Um, awesome. they're, uh, they're keen to to have me bang on a, a lot about film, I'm sure, wow. um, which I will be talking a bit about. And You, uh, you could, you could yeah. just take the interview we just did and just, just play that on the big screen and say, play here, that you, and just you, sit back. You want to learn about film? Here's the master. Yeah, listen Where to this guy. <laughs> listen to this guy. Um, I've, I've also been very lucky to uh, to land a bit of a job um, for one of a better phrase, decorating uh, a new uh, medical surgery that is awesome. uh, opening right next door to Ocean Grove Camera and Photo. So um, That's I will be. I have made uh, ten massive canvas prints for that location. They'll be getting hung over the weekend, and then uh, I'm making another ten next week for their other location in Ocean Grove. Beautiful. Road. Are they are they quickly on the side? Are they for sale? Those commissioned, or no, are they they no. outright purchased them for their? They've outright purchased them oh, from beautiful. me um, to put on display, which is pretty cool because that is cool. Um, it's also a cross promotion for the shop right next door. So yeah, that's perfect. Um, I've seen. Uh, I'll I'll. I'll uh, I might do a few selfies and stuff while we're installing that and chuck them up yeah. on the show next week or something. You should do uh, a time do a time lapse if you're hanging them all up. It's very cool um, to to deck out offices. I've done a couple now. I did one mm. in Melbourne for a mate of mine. Um, uh, I think we did similar about ten big canvases. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, and they look yeah. awesome. They they really it's really cool to see a, a whole group of only my photos in one area. Yeah, it's um, good fun. particularly because I've taken the photo, I've printed the canvas, I've stretched yeah, the canvas, yeah. and I've even hung the bloody thing. So, yeah. <laughs> so talk about doing the whole lot. Well, that, that's 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 the beauty of it all. And um, I think we've spoken about it on the show a bit. Yeah, you know, that that last process of printing and hanging something. Uh, it has a really lovely feeling to it. So that's awesome. Uh, I yep. look forward to next time I visit the shop. I might just go <coughs> go next door and have a quick chat to yeah. the doctor and uh, have a check exactly. out your check out the Brendan Waits Gallery in the Medical Centre. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, okay, folks. So uh, as I say, thanks again to Ben for his time yeah, this morning. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant. We're looking forward to more interviews to come, and we're also looking forward to chatting to you guys next week on episode thirty three of the Down South Photo Show. Awesome. Cheers, guys. See you later.